Viewers of the Civic Space TV, friends of the Youth Roundtable, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to yet another episode of the Youth Roundtable. Today we shall have a conversation around two very pertinent fronts. The first is the status of the constitution of the Republic of Uganda and how do we find ourselves having such a constitution, having gone through maybe several amendments uh, regarding the 1995 constitution. But we know that our constitution as a country has had a several history finding us of where we are today. But also the issue around the prices of commodities here in Uganda. Just last week I traveled to Gulu, where I come from, and my mother asked me to carry her a bar of soap. I couldn't believe how much I had to pick out of my pocket to procure for her a bar of soap. Among its other very essential commodities, Ugandans at the lowest levels of this country are grappling with these prices. But we haven't seen Parliament of Uganda or the government of Uganda doing so much to intervene is it because our economy is a liberal economy and that the forces of demand and supply dictate the market prices and government has very limited intervention regarding setting prices and setting price ceilings? Well, we are here to appreciate and understand all that in just um, a snippet of time. And to uh, enable us to understand this, I'm joined by a panel of usually, of course, very, we look out for the best, you know, the best of the best, the cream, to, um, you know, enable us to appreciate some of these conversations. and. I shall introduce them and ask them to say hello to our viewers and maybe say something more about themselves in case I have forgotten. From my extreme right is uh, my good friend and comrade. I have known him in the struggle of so many things. Ndugu Okori Brian is the Secretary for Finance of the Uganda National Students Association. I also know that he just got recently, as the, uh, recently elected as the chairperson of ROSA. Ndugu Okori Congratulations and you're welcome, sir. Thank you, Comrade Kidega. My name is Okori Brian. As earlier mentioned, I'm the Secretary of Finance of Uganda National Students Association and a new chair elect, as the earlier said, of, uh, of an alumni association of my former secondary school, which is Rock High School, Tororo. Just got elected on Saturday. So it's nice to be here. It's my maiden appearance. I'm happy to be here again. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much. We are glad that you spared the time to be with us respective of your very busy schedules and responsibilities. Thank you. Many thanks. Uh, next to Comrade Okori is uh, my good friend that I know all the way from Makere University by the names of Naluima Agwang. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, Agwang is um, a lawyer. She's also a Rotarian and a patriot. Agwang, you're most welcome. You want to say hello to our viewers? Thank you very much, Kidega. Uh, good afternoon to our dear viewers. As he introduced me, my name is Samantha Naluima Aguang. And yes, I'm a lawyer, a patriot, and, I, and, and I'm Ugandan, first of all. So that sort of inspires my patriotism. Because while so many other people are looking for how it benefits them, I just want our country to grow because this is our home, really. So, which also informs why I agreed to sit here because we are trying to find a way forward, right? Yeah, As sure. a young people of the nation. So I'm happy to be here and I look forward to a fruitful deliberation. Yeah, yeah nice. What uh, Rotary Club do you belong to? Muyenga Tank Hill. Muyenga. Yeah. Ah, very interesting. Um, you should inspire our viewers to also join some of these Rotary Most Clubs. Definitely. Sure, sure. Um, next to Comrade Samantha is uh, my leader at the university, mm. the president of the Makere Law Society a very distinguished gentleman by the names of um, Percy Christopher Impima. Impindi. Impindi, sorry. Yeah. Uh, Percy joins us equally as a first timer. Percy, you're most welcome. Our viewers would love to listen to you. A very good afternoon, our viewers. I'm so happy to be here for my first time and I look forward to the engagements. As he mentioned, my name is Percy Christopher Impindi, the president of the Macrae Law Society the Students' Union at the Macquarie University, and I hope that um, we can be able to have a fruitful engagement on these key issues today. Oh, very interesting. Next to Pasi and uh, on my immediate right is uh, my former boss at UNSA, and also I know she was vice president of the Chambogo University Students Guild a couple of years ago. She was vice president of UNSA, now she is the Secretary for Female Affairs of the Iwanda District Youth Council. She traveled all the way from Iwanda last evening to be with us. Mm. She's also an entrepreneur. Um, she's the CEO of Variat, Variat uh, Cosmetic Products. Mm. Yeah, very interesting, creating jobs for your own self but also for others. 
Helen Nsima is the name. Helen, thank you for joining us. Yeah, good afternoon, viewers. Thank you, Comrade Kidega. It's not true that I was vice president many years ago. I was vice president in 2019. <laughs> you make viewers think I'm very old. <laughs> okay. But thank you for watching. Thank you for always joining us for the Youth Roundtable. And I'm glad to be here. Can't wait to see what my fellow panelists have for Uganda. And yeah, let's engage. Oh, very interesting. And let us, you know, cut to the chase. Uh, Comrade Pasi, the elephant in the room today is um, the constitution of the Republic of Uganda. Mm -hmm. And the question that many young people would ask themselves is, does this constitution serve the purpose of the ordinary Wanainchi, the ordinary Ugandan? But also, many people don't understand how we find ourselves having the 1995 constitution, its, its history, and where some of these articles borrowed from the 1900 Buganda Agreement, the 1901 Ankole Agreement, and those other several ordinances and orders in council Mm. I mean, how do we find ourselves having this constitution? Just, just a brief background, then I also give Comrade Samantha a chance to elaborate on the background. All right, thank you, Comrade uh, Kidega, once again. So many attempts have been made for the past so many decades to work around the concept that Uganda is. Many have called it a project, a British project. Yeah. Uh, the likes of Professor Samwiri Lunigo think it's uh, an Indian colony. So, but besides all that, it boils down to one fact. Uganda and what has come to be known as the state, the Republic of Uganda, is a concept that has been in progress for so many decades. And one of such attempts at, you know, concretizing this concept has been reducing the aspirations of the people. I'm using people in quotes as mm. I will elaborate mm. as we go forward. Of the people to be in the letter of the law. And this attempt has been undertaken in a constitution world over. Constitutions play a very important tool in state and nation building, right from some of the oldest states to even recent states. The first place to go is, is how do we go through the constitution making process. Yes. Uganda isn't an alien to this fact. Uh, from the time the British set foot here and uh, to, to when they left even to today, attempts have been made by different people, mainly those in power, at reducing the aspirations of the people through a letter of the law in the constitutions. We've had a number of constitutions straight from 1962, 1967, and, and of course, the so many decrees, presidential decrees, legal notices, uh, 1985 uh, notices, to where we are, the 1995 constitution. It's also important to note the politics of constitution making. Well, as many would want to view the Constitution as a legal document, in the history of Uganda, it has become apparent that in many ways, this is actually also a political document, given the different mechanisms that have been undertaken previously to have a Constitution. So, straight from the 1962 Constitution, where we see uh, provisions like uh, autonomous states to some regions like Buganda, to pigeonhole constitutions where someone, uh, you know, uh, implements his will upon the land, upon the people through uh, the, the whole absurd stories of the pigeonhole constitution, to now the 1995 constitution where after the 1985 to the 19. 95 situation of you know the turmoil the civil strife ugandans through the um the, the nrm government of course the nra at the time were making an attempt at one recognizing the past the history of uganda but also taking into consideration the present and the posterity the future of the land so the process of making the 1995 constitution has been greatly written about 
it involved a constituent assembly of a seven, about 74 individuals from different um, stakeholders in the country, from trade unions, the NRA, uh, those appointed by the president were 10, the NRA were 10 individuals. The National Youth Council uh, had four individuals on the constituent assembly. And of course, the women from the grassroots. And about the women, the 1995 constitution has so many unique facts to it, but those will be elaborated as we go forward. So all this process that was undertaken was like many other processes, a very expensive one and long process of constitution making. Actually, uh, the 1995 constitution took, uh, took about $20 million in the constitution making process. Uh, the government of Uganda at the time contributed 42% and donors, the European Union, as uh, you can name it, contributed the other percentage. So what we have as the constitution of Uganda of the 1995, the 287 articles of the constitution mm -hmm. constitutes to be one of the, of the longest texts, legal texts in the, in the world. I think it's about 10 times the length of the US constitution. So of course, that, that's given that there are sections, or rather there are articles in our constitution that address so many administrative issues. There are articles, specific detailed articles, like uh, those on the rights found in chapter four of the constitution. So what has come to be known as the 1995 constitution in summary is an attempt, a national attempt at righting the wrongs of the Ugandan past. Now, some of the unique aspects of the 1995 constitution is the fact that under Article 3, it recognized that we've had so much political turmoil, turmoil uh, 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 in constitution making. So there is what in law we call the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the theory, the Kelsen theory, that once a government has been toppled through violence, once another regime establishes itself, that regime can to an extent um, claim to legitimacy. So the, the 1995 constitution under Article 3 bars any such attempts. So that's a, a clear recognition of our past, the political turmoil. But also the extent to which the 1995 constitution undertook uh, the inclusive approach of one, the historically marginalized individuals in our communities, like the women. And uh, that, that's another one. Then also the express explanation on the human rights and then their enforcement is other unique aspects of the Uganda 1995 constitution. So that is where we come from and that is our present. Of course, it remains a question of fact as to where, whether as a tool of good governance and democracy, the 1995 constitution was worth the pennies, the $20 million, the time spent by the Justice or Dochi Commission, the time dedicated to it as a nation, it remains a, a question of fact, and the panelists will, of course, deliberate on that. It remains also a question, uh, a subjective one, as to whether the different provisions, the very elaborate provisions on human rights, political freedoms, are things that have been, in the essence, put into practice. So that, that, that is, of course, a question of fact. And there have been also uh, conversations around self-governance of certain regions in Uganda and how much the 1995 constitution attempted at striking a balance at all these interests. So that is where we come from. And this is a representation all it's, it ought to be a representation of our future aspirations as a nation. And that is all these aspirations as a country composed into this constitution, which has formed the grand norm of the land. Wow, fair enough. You've almost um, 
explored it all, I, I wonder if Samantha might have so much to say. But well, I'll just give her an opportunity. <clears throat> and just picking it up from where Comrade uh, Percy stopped, and he asked very pertinent questions that I think I'll just carry on. But before I do that, let's go to, to go back to the preamble of the Constitution. And I'll just uh, cite out the first two statements. That we, the people of Uganda, recalling our history, which has been characterized by political and constitutional instability, recognizing our struggles against the forces of tyranny, oppression, and exploitation. Let's first look at those particular two statements. And my question to you, Samantha, is that do you think this constitution actually took heed of recalling our history, but also recognizing our struggles? Because with the way Percy uh, put it out, and uh, towards the end, he poses a very pertinent question that considering the, the, the resources we invested, the human resource, uh, the, the, the financial resource and the time we put, did it actually um, expose the interest of the ordinary Ugandan and therefore appreciate our, our history? But also, anything else that you think maybe Percy could have missed out regarding our constitutional history, then we can move on from there. Um, thank you very much, Moses. Uh, Percy does a really good job in painting the backdrop upon which the 1995 constitution was promulgated. And he brings out very salient uh, pointers on the processes that were taken um, in the process of creating what we have today as the constitution, the documents that we have today. But just as he pointed out, the process was not one that was clear of um, shortcomings here and there. So from the onset, the constitution making process was a process filled with coalitions different groups trying to push the agendas. How do we make it to the pages of the constitution? Yeah. From the onset, the 1962 constitution was a coalition between Kabaka, Kabaka Eka and UPC. Yeah. So the Protestants and the Royalists. Yeah. <laughs> Where did that leave uh, DP and the other parties at the time? Mm. So from the onset, there were coalitions. Mm. How do we get our interests onto the pages of this national document? The 1966 constitution, Pigeon Hall, members of the General Assembly finding a document that they do mm. not have, that they did not make, that uh, whose input was not theirs at all. They find a document in, the, in their pigeon holes and yeah. they are forced to constitute themselves into a constituent assembly and pass this document without mm. even debating it or digesting the contents. Again, a game of interests. Yeah. How do I get my interests onto the pages of this important document? The 1966 constitution was followed by the banning of political parties. Generally, the law was put to rest mm. during that period. And then we saw that as Obote was marching to parliament, he marched with troops. This is now a common thing. <laughs> it's not news anymore for mm. people to march to parliament when it's time to make very important decisions. Yeah. With troops, black members, just to remind you of what could happen yeah. if you decided in the alternative. I mean, there is... That popu I remember there was a time we were all in disarray when the leader of the nation threatened parliamentarians. He told them he would shrink their powers even further if they failed to pass uh, the term limits bill. Yeah. So if there is nothing new happening, this is how we have, if there is one thing we have been consistent in, it's how we've been formulating our laws, the manipulation, the games we've been playing from the onset. None of this is new. And then... Maybe just to look uh, closer at the processes that were employed uh, in the promulgation of the 1995 Constitution, the role played by the Constitution uh, by the Constitutional Commission. Mm -hmm. There's an act at the time, the 1988 Constitutional Commission's Act, mm -hmm. and it clearly stipulated how the members of the Commission were supposed to be appointed. There is a very huge question in whether or not the act was considered because many of the appointments were political in nature. Mm. It was headed by uh, Justice Benjamin Odoji. For those of you who know that gentleman, you know he loves dialogue. Mm. So he actually did his part. He mm. uh, really traversed the nation in trying to solicit ideas from the nationals, the mm. women, the youth. Mm -hmm. uh, so many processes were engaged. Essay writing competitions, um, memoranda were written, newspaper articles. Ugandans actually had their say in how this document would eventually be crafted. But then there is also so much said as to how much made it to the document. Many of these documents were vetted mm. by the powers at the time. Mm. So the question that passes asks on whether 
the money that spent the, the, the money that was spent the it's 20 million us dollars whether it was put to good use mm. is answered in that yeah. manner so we 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 spent the money for a good cause we collected information views yeah. did we use the information mm. you have the answer so meaning uh, you're trying to say that um what is there is that there is a good constitution but the spirit of constitutionalism is is lacking or or we can expound that later on the document that we have is a good document is a good document it could have been better okay because what i'm trying to say here is that ugandans were engaged as much as possible information was collected mm. but not all that information was used this okay. information was saved because it came to I mean, women were engaged. Uh, by the way, this is one of the processes that really engaged women. Okay. Someone could argue that there was a quid pro quo kind of arrangement because yeah. you see organizations like you Maybe for the interest of our viewers, quid yes. pro quo is something for something. Something for something. Yeah. Give me this, I give you that. Yeah. So there was so much bargaining. What am I getting out of this process? What do you need me to give? Mm. So the process was sort of mad with that kind of arrangement. Mm. And many argue that it came back to bite us. Okay. Because... There were so many women that were at the forefront of pushing for certain agendas in mm. the 1995 constitution, most of which was the NRM agenda. And we were promised so much. Mm. But when it was our time to reap, mm. some of us did not reap as we thought we'd reap. For example, in the amendment of the 1998 Land Act, women's interests were not considered so much. And m very many women felt betrayed at that yeah. point because they had supported the movement. Okay. They thought this was time for them to be supported. Okay. And so they felt betrayed in that aspect. And someone would argue that now it had come back to, the ghosts had come back to haunt them. Mm. The ghosts that they had shelved had now come back to haunt them. Okay. Because women were at the forefront of this constitution. And there are so many questions on some of the material that was being provided on these mm. tours, okay. on the consultations that were being made at the time. Because I, I once interacted with someone who was there at the time because many of us on this panel were not born yeah. at the time. Yeah. So... Uh, we, we just hear about these things, we read about them. And mm. I was told that the pamphlets that they were sharing at these seminars at the conferences had advantages mm. of... Um, advantages. They were sort of showing you why mm. you need to mm. make certain de decisions that favoured the movement. Mm. And not so much was... Uh, the discussion was not objective. Yeah, and, and, and maybe later on we shall discuss about um, how the NRA by then uh, propagated the need for us to have a multi-party dispensation yes. where they use the famous to be Jeko mm -hmm. narrative. But, but, yes. but just shortly, um, Ndugu Okori, mm -hmm. let me just take you to chapter 2 of the constitution which speaks about the republic. In 1962, the British said we are leaving Uganda as an independent state and we are you know, packing our belongings and going back to, to Europe or wherever they came from. But it looks like, as Percy tried to explain to us, they did not actually leave because they went ahead to fund, you know, our constitutional making process. So it looks like they didn't actually leave us um, uh, uh, independently, as we assumed. But also, let me just um, read for you uh, Article 5, um, Clause 1, which says that... No, no, not Clause 1. No, Article 6, Clause 1, which says that the official language of Uganda is English. Wasn't that the point where we began to um, lose direction in terms of creating an autonomous and independent country. Because if we are saying that let us now do away with the British and whatever they are done in this country, then why should we continue to adapt the language that they introduced? Why not say, okay, now that they've gone, let's have Kiswahili. Let us make Kiswahili the national language. But also it looks like this colonial mentality went further to the education system. Mm -hmm and you are a student leader, I believe that you have views about our education system and whether it is a colonial education system or it is, uh, or it is actually tailored for the African child, for the African school-going child. So speak to two fronts, the aspect of um, colonialism staying with us and it being entrenched in our constitution. But two, do you think that the education system was actually generically um, Ugandan engineered or it was you know, just copy and paste from from the British and then bring it here. So those those two points. <clears throat> I think uh, when uh, when when the British were were leaving this country, I will use the the statement bait. They left the bait, which was Oboti, mm -hmm. because uh, when they were leaving, they they said Oboti would be prime minister, mm. and, and 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 Kabaka would be the president mm. per se. 
So I think their principles were still being passed through that gentleman and, uh, and was listening to them. The British have never left Africa as a whole and has never, <laughs> never left Uganda, I can say that. Mm. And they have a lot of interest here. Saying that they funded uh, the, the, the making of the constitution, it's not new. They have funded a couple of things more than that. <laughs> yes. And they still have their, their rich interests here. And that is why you see, uh, beside the British only, even the, the, other, the other countries in the West always have a lot of interest in, uh, in seeing how they can amalgamate us and, and fail us from having a true direction. Mm. So me, I could call this constitution an inclusive document. We've been calling it a good document. It was just inclusive, where they made sure everybody would bring their minds on board. Still, the British was taking over. They were, they were giving the ideas on how we would have some articles made, maybe. Because when you fund, when you don't, when you donate, let's say, you can never let what you've donated go the way you want it to go. Mm. So me, I think uh, the constitution was inclusive in a way that uh, when you look at the same constitution, there's, there's even an article somewhere where the elderly are catered for, mm. that they will, their, their, their rights will be protected for, meaning even those who were designing it by that time knew that they will grow old one time in this country mm. and they will want to be protected mm. by the same laws around. So uh, the, the talk of British and, and, and our culture and, and whether they have left us, it's, it's really a long discussion because because uh, if we can still accept to be part of the Commonwealth practices mm. yeah, and a couple of those things, I even think the National Youth Council, which mm. a couple of our friends belong to, was a policy that was passed by them, mm. that all Commonwealth states would have National Youth Councils in their yes. countries That's to true. have them govern in the right direction. So we are still carrying on with our practices. We still listen to them, which, are, which would be good if we'd listen to them in an objective manner but it can be bad if you listen to them uh, wholly and have nothing to object from them. Mm. I think President Museveni, and a few times, if he's not pretending, has tried to object a couple of these things on camera and say, allow us to do a few other things alone. So, the constitution as it is, uh, whether, they, they, whether they were part of it fully, whether they have uh, made it to look that way, Uganda still have a chance to keep amending it. That's just like it's been happening over and over until these changes can make it look a better document. Yes, of course, uh, you talked about the education system being fully British. It is fully British. Uh, one time I was arguing this, I think that was in, a, was in a Russia when we were arguing over, over the issue of, uh, of our curriculum. As Africa, why would you study Napoleon and all those, 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 those people? How does it help uh, a student here? Then how, how rich is that history? And how best can it can you bring it back into practices here? And we're saying, can we have uh, a curriculum that is African best, where we can study real African things, and we know we are for Africa. Mm. It might be Ugandan entirely, but at least if we copy practices from other African states, and we we come together. And to as an idea, we're saying if all the ministers of education all over Africa would meet in Uganda, we have the curriculum uh, review center. And, and we see how we can have a curriculum that is African-centered. We withdraw these things that, they, that we learn from the whites that don't help us anymore. And that has been a debate over and over. Can you run away from English? <laughs> it's what we're using right now. Because if you started speaking Swahili, maybe me and you can speak it. The rest wouldn't speak it. Mm. Uh, the East African community has brought it to practices that uh, Swahili will be an official language in the mm. East African community. But still, how many people adopt to it? Yeah. yeah, when uh, when you when when, they, when 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 you start studying English from senior one, all the from P P one, mm. all time with nursery, you'll be hearing that they they, they bring Swahili as an optional subject, mm. and many run away from it uh, in during the whole over time of study, meaning the country itself is not ready to, to run away from the from, from, from the, from British. the British of doing things. So should we be more intentional about some of these things? Of course, we have to be more intentional about some of these things. Yeah. Uh, I, because uh, I imagine if government put up a policy and said that any school that is uh, for you to be recognized by the National Council for Higher Education, mm. your curriculum must have Kiswahili. And that, that is, and, uh, that, that is, that that is happening. That is happening. Mm. Even when I was getting done with my diploma in civil engineering, the last semester I was studying Swahili. Okay. But it's, people don't take it serious. It's mm. because... Even the institutions of learning don't see need okay. for, the, for the language itself. But for us, we are saying that, that, that at least can we adopt some of these languages? Mm. 
in Uganda, by the time the, the British were living, there were a lot of languages around and, and they were wondering, can you make Uganda the official language? Mm. Make the language the official language? And all we're saying, if you make this official language, it will mm -hmm. become superior over us, so mm. we better remain with English. Yeah. So that was the fight that was on the table. Yeah. So I, mean, I think Swahili is good enough. Uh, it is tested when you go to other East African community states that we are part of. They speak Swahili. Yeah. They can easily get you. You can yeah. trade. You can do anything. I, 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 just on second, I think those who are advocating for maybe um, Buganda to be the official language <laughs> could have addressed their mind to the article of, I think, Chidi Makubia. Mm. Um, Buganda's factor in Uganda's politics. Yeah, so, yeah. well, fair enough. Um, I have to come to Helen, but Samantha, your hand is up. <laughs> yes, I just, I just wanted to supplement on what he okay. said about donor engagement in Uganda. You know, it's really funny because donors have always been here. And at some point, they were even, some people believed them to be pro movementist okay. because they were looked at as people that were pushing Museveni's agenda okay. at the time. It's funny how he comes up now to go on national TV and tell people that the donors should leave us alone mm. when at a certain time they were serving his agenda. Yeah. So again, it's a game of interest. Yeah. On the question of our education system, my question is simple. What has stopped us from morphing? We call it the British system. The British system. Yeah. They've totally changed. They're not even using that system anymore. That's true. They gave us what they thought was good at the time. Mm. They went back home and morphed into something totally different. Yeah. What has stopped us as Ugandans from tailoring a system that works for us. Yeah. We can't keep pointing at them and saying, you gave us a system that doesn't work, mm. but they left what has stopped us from changing. But can't we cut the government of Uganda some slack and say that they have managed to at least have more vocational training institutions being set up? Maybe, because I believe it's a piecemeal approach. It cannot be an overhaul of, you know, all over, like out of the blue, you overhaul the current system, then bring in a whole new system. I think it should be a gradual phasing out of the old system which I think the NRM government has, has tried to do. We see now more vocational institutions, more U, UCCs and more UTC. So yeah, maybe it's, it, it could take some time. But I think yeah. our challenge is designing a system that enables us to participate in a global village. We live mm. in a global village now. That's right. Because at the end of the day, you might have the technical skills and mm. fail to market yourself yeah. in a global village. So for example, what are they teaching the children in kindergarten? You know, if you interacted with a child that goes to an international school today, a three-year-old, mm. you'll be amazed by how much they know. The reading culture, mm. how they look at their perspective on life generally. What mm. has stopped us mm. from changing? I mean, if, if, we, if we must, yep. let's copy like we did in the beginning. Mm. Let's copy from the new, the, new, the new notes that they're using. Let's refer to that, you know? Maybe can we say that the Minister of Education and Sports is proposing uh, pupils to have access to their smartphones? Maybe that is some other way of them bringing technology closer to the students. Yes. Okay. So I, my, my own opinion is that it could take us some time. Yeah. We don't need to rush it. Otherwise, if we do, then I, I also believe that we could be headed for tragedy. But, well, we can explore that later on. Let me bring in a comrade, Helen. Helen, you heard what Samantha said earlier on, and she was trying to elaborate the participation of women regarding the 1995 constitution formulation process. And I know the likes of Maria Matembe, we are members of that commission. Mm -hmm. I don't know which other or um, other women who are part of that Winnie constitution. Yanyima. Winnie Vyanyima yeah. uh, was Cecilia Ogwal among, um, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, so clearly it looks like um, the process had the involvement of women. And I believe that is why we find ourselves in, with Article 33, the rights of women, mm -hmm. you know, which is really anchored around how can we empower the minority groups in society. And um, I, will, I will say it on camera that you're a beneficiary of this affirmative action. You're the Secretary for Female Affairs of the Youth Council of your district, a position that only a young female could contest for. Yeah. So some of these articles looked like they were are engendered towards, you know, uplifting the, 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 the groups that were seen as a minority. So what is your own take regarding more so the affirmative action of women and of the girl child. Do you think that we have, I mean, look at the education system where a girl is given an extra 1.5, okay, a female, not a girl, is given an extra 1.5, you know, point at the end of their senior six, unlike, you know, contrary to the men. So we can say that there are certain good, you know, policies here and there that were all, that all, that are all as a result of the 1995 constitution. So j just your view around affirmative yeah. action of women. Thank you very much, Kidega. Uh, I want to take us all back to the first five words of the Constitution, or the first five words of the preamble. 
we say we the people of uganda yeah. and i think in the constitutions they're in capital letters mm. and usually when i'm reading the constitution i tend to think that these are the most important words in that in that constitution why mm. because we want to look at ourselves as the people of uganda every time you read a certain article in the constitution before you actually read the article first go back and read that the first five words you say we the people of uganda are saying so when we when the constitution was made and the affirmative action was made it wasn't made for just women it was made for we the people of uganda because we are looking at the constitution clearly says we are bringing in this constitution so that uh, to deal with the traditions and the customs to see that all these uh, traditions and customs affecting certain minority groups mm. women are among the the affected main uh, the minority groups that were affected by the traditions and customs of of you know africa uganda what did we have for example all those uh gender-based violences in the past yes we understand that men have faced these problems but it was really really seen mostly affecting the women because mm. of the patriarchal system that we had in the past and so something had to be done affirmative action wasn't really brought for the women it was brought so that the affected group which was women mm. can move together with the unaffected or slightly affected which were the men yeah. so that the country can go forward we can't always be uh, pretending that everything is fine we can't always be you know being brought back because such a certain group is back you get you, yeah. you're supposed to move together as a country mm. so if one group the disabled one group the old one group uh, the elderly like he said the students is lacking behind it means as a country regardless of whether you the men are moving forward yeah. the women will drag you backwards so yeah. don't look at it as affirmative action is only you know taking care of women and men are, no it's saying that the affected group has to reach a certain level of equality, equality. or inequality mm. or what so that the entire country can move you know together yeah. and, and see the direction moving forward mm. systematically yeah? yeah yeah so that we are moving together and uh, i'm proud of my country right now uh, as as you can see that really the affirmative action has helped women mm. personally like you said i'm a beneficiary at my district i'm the secretary for female affairs a position only held by a female okay. uh, but also even when i was at uh, chambogo university the, the, the our constitution would say if the president is male your vice president should be female okay. same as i think the uganda national students association if the president is male it doesn't mean you're not elected mm. or no you for example in, in unsa you were elected but mm. at least make sure that if the president is male or female you know yeah. but that doesn't mean that we shall take up females whether you are, you can afford to stand in this position you can you you have the credentials to take up this position no we are saying that there are so many females that have the credentials we are saying that there are so many women that have the knowledge and wisdom to run certain positions so look at those females mm -hmm. now give them the opportunity to stand give them the opportunity to be in those positions so that i i, I don't know how to bring this out yeah. for example if the four of us the way we, uh, you've seen how you arrange this panel yes you are trying to it's not affirmative action mostly it's gender balance probably okay. mm. but also you went into and looked into who can i bring onto this panel it's mm. not just about gender balance mm. so when people look at these females in uh, these big positions they're like ah that's affirmative action or that's gender balance no the, the these females have shown the capability of mm. being in this position and it so happens that the affirmative action is there that mm. they're in those positions we shouldn't just demean them just because of the affirmative action mm -hmm. okay but, but just uh, a follow-up question do you think affirmative action things like for example ring fencing or gazetting leadership political positions for women and um an aspect that i mentioned earlier on the extra 1.5 point given to the girl child to maybe encourage them to go to school do you think these affirmative actions actually address the root cause of the problem because i want to believe that for example the 1.5 extra point given to a young uh, girl joining university was maybe to enable them get the encouragement and the zeal to keep up in school well knowing that okay there's something at the end of the day for me that i will you know benefit from mm -hmm. but do you think the problems like uh, teenage pregnancies the problems like um like school dropouts because of their menstrual their menstrual periods are addressed by only giving you an extra 1.5 point at the end or we should go ahead and address the root cause of these matters issues around gender based violence why are our young girls dropping out of school because if we do that then we won't need to give them the extra 1.5 mm. 
but also the aspect of complacency. Me knowing that there is a position gazetted for me at my district, I won't, I, I won't be motivated to go and compete with other men. Because I know, no, 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 I have my position there waiting for me. I'll just go and bully some other young girl and I have my position. So doesn't this build a culture of complacency among the women? No, I don't think so. First of all, the 1.5, mm. I want to remind you that that 1.5 wasn't even uh, advocated for by, let's say, the first person that mentioned the 1.5 wasn't even a woman. Okay. It was Mukasambide. Oh. Yeah, while he was still a guild president at Makere University. Mm. The, meaning that was someone who saw that this was a need. Mm. You, you get my point? But taking you back to what you said, for example, if if I want you to achieve something, Kidega, mm. I am supposed uh, in in leadership. I'm an entrepreneur and a mm. CEO of a certain of varied care products limited. Mm. When I, I have people I work with, mm. when I want a product a, a product brought up earlier than expected, or when I know that I'm beating a certain time limit, mm. a, a, any other let's say a dictator or a what would just uh, you know keep pushing mm. and pushing but personally i as a leader as a good leader you're supposed to put incentives okay on on how yeah. if you, you if can you motivate people. motivate mm. the people so the 1.5 yes you might say it can't solve the root cause but it's something that as a girl if i'm in primary and I'm, I, I reach a point and I'm like, you know what, these problems of girl children are taking me up. Mm. Every time I remember that at university, I'll have an extra 1.5 added onto my, my, my results. Mm. It, it, it gives me this, like, you know what, let me push. Yeah. Uh, I might reach a certain point and I'm, I'm, I'm you know, it's, it's failing. But I want to see what that 1.5 that was added, I want to see what it will do to my results. But also making sure that, you know, it's not like when they put the 1.5, they relaxed. No, okay. it's not the case. When they put the 1.5, they went on to fight gender-based violence. Mm. They went on to put incentives for, for you know, menstrual periods. Yeah. They, everything is being done, but together. Like, yeah, step by step. Yes, yeah, step by step. Like you said, mm. gradually, mm. We, we, are, we bring it. When the time comes and we realize, you know what, by the way, yes, you pushed the girls, but the mm. boys are lacking, uh, are moving forward, uh, rather backward. I, I'm, I'm, I'm already suggesting that we look for at it and we're like, you know what, it's time to give the boy child the 1.5. Because, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm, because I'll tell you that yeah. Macquarie University released a report that indicated that their intake of the girl child is actually higher yeah. than that of the boy 51%. child. Now, now, 51%. Now, this is what I usually remind people, that yeah. what you're saying is 50-50 right now. Mm. You get There was a time when we were, let's say, 30-20. But right now, where we are is 50-50. Are you sure this is the time to, to sit and you're like, let's remove the 1.5? Mm. No, I want us to first reach a point whereby it's it's 80-20, the way we used to be. Uh. You, you get my <laughs> I, I'm trying to say that okay. we haven't reached that uh. time where a boy child should now get shocked. Get, get, get no, 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 don't worry right now. We are mm. still at 50-50. Yeah. Because you don't know what is going to happen if you remove that 1.5. It, it, you, you could take back the results that we have gained right now, like 20 or 30 okay. years back. Yeah. Uh. So what I'm saying is the boy child shouldn't worry, mm. really. Let's first reach a point where you see that, yeah, now the boy child is really 80-20. But yeah. before, while we are still 51, no. It, okay, it's, it's thank you. Uh, uh, Basi, yeah, I see your hand is up, but let me first ask you my question. Then I'll give you a chance to uh, put up your point. Basi, in 1948, shortly after the end of the Second World War, mm. the United Nations General Assembly uh, came up with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which had about 30 articles of the rights and freedoms of mm. people. Mm. And um, these were very good articles and provisions. But bring it back to our constitution, Article 44 only mentions four non-derogable rights. The right to habeas corpus, the right to a fair hearing, freedom from torture, and freedom from slavery. It looks like out of the 30 articles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Uganda only saw four as non-derogable. The rest, the state can give you when they feel, yeah, you deserve it. Like I think Thomas Hobbes said that the state has a mandate to you know, regulate the rights of its citizens. So it looks like Uganda only picked out four of the 30 very good articles. So the issue of human rights, do you think we... Oh, yes, I know there's a whole chapter, chapter four, regarding human rights. But do you think we have made fundamental progress regarding uh, human rights in this country? Then also your, your concern that you, are, that you have to put up. Ah, thank you, Comrade Chidega. Um, I was, the concern was actually, in an essence, embedded into an answer that I would give to that question. 
my sister Helen mentioned about her favorite five first words in the constitution, we the people. Um, of course, it's, it's my view that this is an illusion. The people, which people? Yeah. Mm. If uh, the, and it's not the first time in the constitution that the word people is used, even in, in article number one. Yeah. Mm. Say it, all power belongs to the people. Um, which people? Uh, is it the people in power? Mm -hmm. Because even at its inception, the majority of the delegates in the Constituent Assembly were movementists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so and we the people. Uh, so which people? Is it yeah. the movementists who are the majority or the people with the guns? Okay. Yeah. So, and, and this has come up even over the years in the life of the Ugandan constitution. Mm. Uh, in other words, one, in fact, one has said, uh, Dr. Kabumba has, has written, that, that Article 1 should actually be restated to say all power belongs to the president who uses the military yeah, to exercise that power. The because power. the people do not have the power mm -hmm. in practice. And, and it's a bitter fact. Yes, true, true. And if at all we hope to talk about the 1995 constitution, not just as a letter of law, but as a document meant to be a, a, a springboard for our, our democracy and but good I think governance. That's misleading. Um, it, it's maybe my sister will come in here. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like it's can, misleading. Uh, can you give a, a minute? <laughs> oh, please. Yeah, sure. Like I feel like when you say, when you tell the country that the power doesn't belong to them, regardless of what you could think or what you could have gone through, I want you to know that this country didn't start with Museveni. This country didn't start with, it started with a certain people. It started with a certain group of people saying, regardless of what the power is saying, regardless of what you people are saying, that you are in power, we, the people of Uganda, are saying we are tired. I don't know if you get my point. When you say that the, peop the power belongs to the president, that, that is not true. Yes, it might on paper and everything that he has done using his power. That is because he understands that he is the people of Uganda. So it's up to you to understand that as well. If you understand that you're the uh, that's people... A, that's an interesting one. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's that's just the just power during the COVID lockdown. I just <laughs> say is, that is because he has understood that he is the people. people. Yes, yeah, so if King you... King Louis <laughs> of the, in, in France, in France. Uh, King Louis the Sixteenth said, Le tasse moi. Yeah. I am the state. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, the constitution clearly says the president. And, and I don't think that's state. a very good sign. I don't think that's a good sign for president of a democratic. Country. No, what I'm saying is he knows but, that uh, he is part of the people. So if you understand that, it's up to you to decide whether you so need the people. He is the people. So does he he act for the people. people. Uh, <laughs> that, that, that is up for debate. But what I'm saying yeah. is he has understood mm. his role in the we are the people. So yeah. it's up to us as other individuals because he's, he's not the Omega and Alpha of this country. Is Isn't he? No, 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 no. no. I'm not saying <laughs> No, no, maybe. What I'm, what I'm just saying is if you <laughs> as an individual no, if you as an individual continue to mm. think like that, you're going to limit yourself. That, that is not what all the revolutionaries th said. They understood that whatever you're saying, that you're the Alpha and Omega, I don't agree with that. The ones mm. who said otherwise are not in the movement now. <laughs> Okay, yeah, fair enough. Just give Pasi a chance to uh, make his point. I, I think, of course, uh -huh. like you've seen, it, it remains a question of debate yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. as to whether, indeed, it was we the people or <laughs> they the people. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But to the question that Comrade uh, Kidega posed to me, the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights yeah. stated quite expressly, and I, I, found, I find this to be very bold assertions, mm. all men should be free. Yeah. Yeah. But 1948, at the time when this declaration was made, we know there was so much racism in even the, the, the countries that yeah. we, you know, we many people consider to be advanced, at least constitutionally speaking. But also, when they mentioned all men should be free, mm. is it a statement that was just made for the political purposes, or it's something that, that, that as one might think, a statement whose talk was ready for those people to also walk, yeah? Mm -hmm. And it remains a question of fact, and these are the facts, really. 1948 to this day, so many decades have gone by, and even when there have been very many um, key milestones undertaken, mm. there is still so much to do, yeah, in order to ensure that men should indeed be free, free. 1962, Uganda gets its independence, but I think it's more of self-rule, but we were still 
independent to certain people. But have these bodies, yeah, have these donors really gone ahead to ensure that they, they let us be free, free from, you know, the, the, the influence, free, flow, free, free from all this sabotage in all our affairs as countries. But also, I think it's some, some fingers, if there are any to be pointed, should be pointed to ourselves. Mm. Yeah. How much as Ugandans have we taken bold steps to ensure self-sustainability mm. in both our political spaces, but even most essentially in our financial spaces, yeah, in our economies? I, I think that is a question of, of fact. But in regard to the non-derogable rights, these are legal uh, it's, a, it's a legal, it's entrenched in the legal understanding mm. of human rights. That there are certain rights which are granted to you, not by the state, but uh, and in the Judeo-Christian values from God himself. Mm. Yeah. The fact that you're born as a human being, you are entitled to move freely. You are entitled to, to, to have your destiny as Bob Marley, you know, put it. <laughs> so... Interesting. Oh, yes. Uh, I find him to be a very <laughs> great philosopher yes. yeah, he was. in the recent time. So that is where Article 44C comes into place, that no matter the circumstances, your right to, you know, habeas corpus, you know, the, the 48 hours mm. once you've been arrested cannot be derogated, yeah. no matter the excuse. But for the rest of the rights, for instance, our right to convene here and speak many things, many that might trouble in different ways to mm. the people in power, sometimes can be uh, limited, more so if it is in the public interest, mm. if it is if there's a public health concern, for instance, in the pandemic, you saw uh, certain people that were saying, no, COVID-19 doesn't exist, and yet we needed a government program of vaccination for the public interest. So that, in such circumstances, one would think it is justified to limit someone's right yeah. to, to their freedom of expression. Yeah. So that's where the derogable, the non-derogable rights come in. Mm -hmm. Then the derogable rights mm -hmm. also put into place. But of course, uh, as to whether all these rights have been sustained by the government or actually... Uh, Respected. Disrespected by the government. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Samantha, yeah, I can see your hand is up and I was, I was coming to you actually. But um, as you uh, prepare to respond, I have a question for you, which is around, for example, the UPDF Act, where we find some of these revolutionary soldiers or freedom fighters entrenching their individual names in some of these very important legal documents. And um, I have addressed my mind to the Magna Carta of 1215, where some of these owls who had managed to, to agitate for, the, for their freedoms wanted to also have you know, their, their names somehow remembered. So it looks like the thing about revolutionaries or the thing, uh, the thing about freedom fighters is that they, they love to be remembered for their contribution. But I think being remembered in a way that you entrench yourself in the country's very pertinent legal document. I, I don't know what's, what your view is, is, is on regarding that, but also um, we have seen this happening not once and not you know the second time. I think it was, I'm not sure of the country, but a president declared himself that I shall be, I think it was here in Burundi, you know, I shall be the president, the, the late um, Javier Imana. No, sorry, the late Nkurunziza, yeah. who said that I should be the, you know, a senior citizen and then I should, even when I'm no longer president, I should continue to get all these benefits that come with being a supreme leader, you know. He had, he had actually declared himself a supreme leader of the country and whereby he was entitled to all these benefits. So it looks like it's not um, a, a, a unique that even us here in Uganda, some people feel that, you know, my name should be in some of these documents. So just your view on that, about personal, personalizing some of these legal documents, then also your, your hand was up. Okay, mm. so let me start with what I wanted to add yeah. to what uh, Pasi said. First of all, let it just be known out there that all the non-derogable rights 
have been derogated. Let okay. it just be known out there. Because people have gone missing and we don't know where they are. And very little effort has been made to present them. I mean, you, you, their last scene was when they were taken away by men in uniform. After that, nobody knows where they are. And so for me, I, I, I feel like the question of the people of Uganda and the power that they possess is something that we have contributed to, even us who are born much later after mm -hmm. the promulgation of the 1995 constitution. I once interacted with a senior citizen and he told me uh, th those elections that preceded the election of the constituent assembly mm. will forever be Uganda's, one of Uganda's most expensive elections. And he pointed out this particular example of a candidate who traveled by, by helicopter from his home to his polling station, which was less than half a mile. So you can imagine state resources being used mm. in that nature. And he talks about how ministers in the then government were using government resources in the guise of uh, government uh, programs to campaign for themselves. Mm. We still see that happening today. So the question was, was, the government, was were government officials bribing voters or are voters turning into extortionists, you know? Mm -hmm. We still see that trend today for those of you that are in the political spaces. Voters will not vote for you if you do not give them something. The, mm. they, they simply say, oh, you're going to eat. It's our turn to eat now. Okay. Give us now because when you go, you're going to eat. And one cattle woman openly told us, <laughs> let me go and eat. In the first time? In, in yeah. the first time. When I come back, we shall all eat. Yeah, now. <laughs> and people clapped. People applauded him for that kind of thinking which mm. which reminds me of a phrase that many people like to use loosely today yes. that really bothers me the national cake the sharing of the national cake mm. we actually view our country as a cake mm. everyone wants a piece mm. we are literally eating up our country guys yeah. we are eating it slowly by slowly i wonder what it's will be left to it. share yeah because at the end of the day no one should be trying to slice this country into several pieces of cake yeah. we should be trying I, I would like us to view our country as a, a as a tree Mm. that's growing each and every one of us should be making our contribution watering pruning here and there mm. there is a lot of pruning that needs to it's be done, done. Yeah. we should look at it as a, a tree that's growing a tree from which our, our predecessors benefited our successors should be able to find that tree and still grow it to an mm. even greater tree so you want to agree with what our president um entitled this book let's sow the mustard seed I wish she was still <laughs> operating on that very script. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm not out here to point fingers because... Um, maybe. I, I think national cake is a movie-fitting town because okay. Uganda isn't a natural creature like a tree. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uganda was something that was baked by the British yeah. for us to partake. Yeah. So I, I think... For us to eat. Actually, it, it, was, it was just, <laughs> just, to, just to supplement. Yeah. It was um, the person who chaired the 19... 61 commission um al 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 wild yeah. in his report he said actually that uganda is an artificial yeah. setting and uh, therefore some of his recommendations of the wild committee was that uganda must you know i mean he did acknowledge that the british were leaving uganda in a very yeah. uh, a dire situation and they kept on pondering that how shall we how how will this country that we have created for colonial borders mm -hmm. live you know, um, uh, harmoniously after we have left. So, mm. but, so that's just to agree with you yeah. that mm. the country mm. was, you know, the colonial borders somehow affected um, yeah. where we find ourselves today. Yeah. But uh, Samantha, yes, yeah, just, just to conclude and then here. answer the question you pose. Mm. Um, national cake is a term we use, yes, but I still insist mm. we are we are natural beings mm. and we constitute this country. Every single day presents us an opportunity to change the mm. status quo. Mm. We, each of us, by the way, in our individual capacities, has an opportunity to change the way things are done. When you sit at your desk in the morning, how you do your work mm. has a lot to do with the general picture that mm. is Uganda at the end of the day. Mm. So as a Ugandan, before you point fingers at anyone that's at the top there, what are you doing in your own tiny little way? Mm. Every after five years, you're presented with an opportunity to make a change. Mm. What do you choose? Do you choose peace? peace mm. to maintain the peace mm -hmm. if there is any peace at all mm -hmm. because there is actually so much turmoil in the silence that we see today mm. so are you choosing that are you choosing to maintain that status quo or are you actually going to step out and, and try to change and try to push for a better uganda mm. or are you just going to sell your power as we have done every after five years mm. try to cut yourself a tiny piece of the national cake mm. okay so 
when are they when are they appointing RDCs? How do I position myself? Mm. Let me also get myself into this position. So we still have power as Ugandans. Mm -hmm. How we use it is a whole other debate. How we choose to use it because at the end of the day, it's you and your ballot. Is it because that um, the civic consciousness of the ordinary Ugandan is still lacking? And this, I think, Professor Honorable Justice Kanyahamba one time proposed that why should every Ugandan be given the responsibility to elect the head of state? Why can't we find a class of citizens that is um, civically aware and that can take conscious decisions to vote on behalf of everyone else? Like it is done maybe in the USA, where That's the actually college a very system. plausible argument. That's yeah. a very plausible argument because imagine putting ourselves in a position where we're voting a national head, but the decision is based on a bar of soap on a kilogram of sugar. Yeah. I feel that's a way too heavy. That's that's a burden way too heavy for certain members of our society. But then again, we should not totally remove them, them from, from the, the decision, right to choose. from decision making. Yes, yeah, yeah. but then. For me, again, when it comes to civic education in Uganda, that, that particular right has also been curtailed from the onset. During the process of uh, the constitution, mm. during the constitutional making process, there were several organizations, I think ACFORD, UNED, they came together to form an organization that was doing civic education here and there, and they were banned. Mm. They were banned from doing that. Okay. So the intention was never there. No one wanted us to be educated in terms mm. of our civil rights. Okay. So th that's a challenge that we face today. On the question of the UPDF, mm. to be honest, I don't think many in uniform think like us. Okay. And so when we require them to act in a democratic manner, we require too much of them. Oh. They should be able to act like that, mm. but they don't think like us. Mm. They are convinced that theirs is a more better understanding of society. Their, a role has been bestowed upon them to protect us. Question is who bestowed upon them that role? So when you ask them to act democratically, you, I believe you're asking too much of them, but in their perspective, you're asking too little of them. Mm. You want us to, you want democracy? We're giving you peace? You want democracy over peace? That's, that's actually how they put it. So yeah. that, that, that discussion is a very broad one because they are convinced they don't think like us. Mm. They are convinced we don't know what we want and yeah. they should act for us to protect us. Mm. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, Ndugo Kori, my last question to you before you go for the break mm. is around the doctrine of separation of powers. That the executive must be independent. Or, well, they must be interconnected for the smooth running of the country because I don't think the legislature should operate in isolation. Yes. But there's a doctrine of separation of powers that let the executive work, at least let it, let it be semi-autonomous. So should the legislature, sh so should the judiciary. Yeah. But the way it looks like today, for example, it's like the executive seems to have much more control over both the judiciary and over the legislature. For example, look at how the chief justice is, 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 is gotten. You know, the executive plays a very central role towards appointing. And of course, parliament approves, yes, but they can only approve what the executive has, has, has sent to them. So I think, yes, whereas... Um, the doctrine of separation of powers is, is ideal. I think that our constitution somehow maybe um, missed a step because if you are to borrow from the Kenya 2010 constitution whereby they made the selection of their head of the judiciary a public interest process where the public actually contributes towards making recommendations and making uh, contributions towards who becomes the chief justice. So uh, the, the question around uh, the, the doctrine of, of separation of powers but two um, the aspect of the UPDF being in Parliament, is it? I, I don't know. What's your view? <laughs> I think when uh, I, I engaged with one of the members of the CA, that is Ramushana Charles, and he told me that when we're making the Constitution, all of those uh, articles you see are to favor one man, and that is the President of the country. Because uh, look at it. When I appoint you, do, do, I exp do, you, do Ugandans now expect anything new from you? They say, Justice uh, a window. What new thing will he do? Yet uh, the appointing authority that gave him power is telling him do this. The footage that came up one time when he was at State House uh, prior to a judgment, uh, and he came up denying them. But yes, they were true. it was true that he was there. I think uh, the framers of the Constitution still knew uh, that 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 Museum Seven would live so long. And so they wanted to, to know how they can keep him in power mm. longer. Mm. 
I, I, when, when they were removing the term limit at one time, people were arguing that I think after these two terms, the, the, the gentleman will go. After some times, again, they said, okay, let, let's remove the, the age limit that I don't urge you off so much because it helps. We saw the Katumbas come up. We saw young people contest for LC5 after a long time because you can't measure someone's capability with, 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 with how old they are. I think there should be a constitutional review on, uh, on one appointment of the Chief Justice and uh, the operations of Parliament because when the accounting office of Parliament is also appointed by the President, I think. So if the accounting officer is my own, where you go to beg for fines and, and undo all those things from him to administer you as a Parliament, then what new thing will you do independent? Of course, you will not sit anyway. If you sit and refuse to give your allowance as members of Parliament, that means you have to consent to the accounting officer in that kind, in that, kind, in that point of view. And again, look at the appointment of the of the of the of the chairman electoral commission. It's not done the same way in Kenya as you're saying. Some of these positions are not just people are not just handpicked and given positions and said, please go and vet. Which vetting also, you know, that the parliament is entirely uh, for the for the president. Last time when they were voting for for, for speakership, just this this two or some days back. You saw Sewungu saying, please remove your cameras from here. And it, was, it looked like he didn't understand what was happening. The man was saying, please, you cannot vote when the cameras are looking at us like this. So I think all, all, all what we're talking about is about, uh, about a rotten document, may I call it a rotten document, that should be changed. If there's any time that, uh, that, that, that you can say constitution is good, is the constitution favors the sitting president. Even if Museveni goes, I know the next president will, will also refuse to amend. Mm. But at any time, let Uganda stand for the right, and that's through the parliament maybe, mm. to make sure all these amendments are done untimely. Mm. Because even if Museveni goes, if I am president, let's say, mm. those, those laws favor me. Mm. Because I, can, I know you know, I'm a, the electoral commission chairperson on my side, I have the chief justice on my side, I can stay longer. Mm. The issue so of the in, UPDF, okay. the issue of the UPDF in parliament, is a very pertinent issue. The question is, what do they do there? Some of these people just go to parliament to wait for time to vote. They say nothing. I've never seen a member of, a member of parliament representing UPDF saying anything. Maybe saying their names if they ask for roll call, they do that. Mm. Some of these people are there to, 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 to increase on the magnitude of how they will vote for motions and bills to pass through. And that's the same problem I have with the affirmative action positions, the youth MPs, the, 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 the women workers. MPs now, the workers. These people say nothing, most of them. Yeah. Though uh, one of these days I've seen we isn't are proactive. That, isn't that an unfair indictment yeah. on the likes of Honorable Court I, I was landing. The likes of you see, Yamato, I was landing. Have been, I was landing. Very I was now, you see, Comrade Kidega was landing saying, though we have okay. proactive ones this time, mm. a few of them mm. who are saying something, but there are those who have never said anything as well on the floor. But yeah. so is the, the, the constituency MP. It's not every constituent MP has said uh, something. So is it, at least, at least it because, it's a biased, it's is it a biased, because parliament, biased, parliament, is, it yeah, because you, parliament you, is too bloated in terms of numbers? Yes. I mean, 530 yeah. MPs. Mm. Mm. When it goes back to the initial process mm. of how we choose our leaders, yeah. mm. why we choose the leaders mm. that we choose. Because I can imagine 530 But if you're not saying anything in, when the, in the plenary, say yeah. it in committee. Yes, what, are, what, what yeah, I'm let's, saying let's is... Let's see you at least articulate somewhere. Yeah, it's not true that <laughs> why I'm not saying something is because I came by affirmative action. No, mm. it's comes down to the yes, individual. Yes. individual yes. You see, the former yes. Speaker of Parliament, may so rest in peace, uh, Jacob Alanya, had, uh, had started the practice of uh, let one person talk, mm. but talk meaningful, yeah. instead of very many people speaking. Okay. There's opposition, let's say Wungu come and present the position of opposition, but after uh, enough so consultation. So quality over quantity. Quality, quality over quantity. That was also good. Then mm. very, very many people coming up to talk. Mm. But again, these people do not even come to Parliament, most of them. Mm. You see, affirmative action came to help, yes. But some of even these ladies have been empowered so much mm. that they don't even help others get empowered. Yeah. Look at Cecilia Ogwal, mm. your woman MP for over 20 or something years. Mm. If you're already a woman MP Still for 10 years, why don't you go and contest for constituency for now? Yeah, that's, that so, me, right? so I'm not right on it. <laughs> I've always been right, you know. That. <laughs> so, so, me, I think. Uh, the affirmative action has already been tested enough. It should be withdrawn. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> really? No. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, I am, I'm withdrawn. sure Helen holds a different view. Yeah, so, Helen, uh, yeah, but, very soon you want you to... to but, to, uh, <laughs> Pasi, can I, can I give you a chance later on? Oh, Our yeah. time is fast spent. We need to go for a break. 
But just before we do that, let me, um, Helen, let me pick your mind on something. Karl Marx was, um, um, I would say, a very profound and well-known communist. And in his book, um, The Manifesto of the Communist Party, he describes the state as a tool used by the bourgeoisie to only dominate and to protect their wealth and to protect their, their capital at the expense of the, of the proletariat, who is the ordinary you know, citizen of the country. So the aspect of the state people relationship, I want you to speak to that. Because I believe that um, the social contract that the people have with the state or with the government is clearly enshrined in Article 1. And I, I believe any other article of the Constitution picks, picks the social contract principle from Article 1, that the state and the people must have a relationship. And Thomas Hobbes went ahead to emphasize this, that for as long as there doesn't exist a relationship, a harmonious relationship between the state and the people, a, a nation cannot build. So do you think in Uganda, the people of Uganda have a relationship with their state? Because I was seeing pictures during uh, the COVID-19 lockdown and women who were going to the streets of Kampala to sell their bogoya, to sell their what, were being clamored down by, 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 by police and they were being beaten off the streets. It looks like there is not so much relationship between the state and the people. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. Do you hold a, a different view? No, not really different. Uh, the state and the people, uh, like, we, like we said, I think it all comes down to the individuals who, are, who we call the state and who we call the people. Mm. The, the, uh, when you say that you saw someone beating up a woman, Mm. I'm sure you've seen another police officer handle a woman bit. Yeah, you get my point. That's true. Yeah, so it's up to the state mm. and w what it wants the relationship between it and the people. What do you? W what does the state want? What do the people want? Like I said, the the, the power that we think we don't have, we actually do. Have it. Mm. Yeah, you at this juncture as a Ugandan, you might say you're not seeing the the, the kind of power you have because you failed to to change a president for let's say 36 years mm -hmm. but you've managed to change your member of parliament. parliament you've managed to change your national youth council okay. person you've managed to change so if you have managed to do those what you would call minor changes okay. you can do the the major changes what you consider the major changes but while you are waiting to do the major changes mm. you We've seen what you've you've seen what, how people were were dealing with uh, the Honorable Hudu Hussein yeah. uh, when he was being transferred to Yumbe and what we don't even know why he was transferred to Yumbe but because of uh, whatever happened in Kampala and mm. what people were let's say celebrating his transfer and probably people's reactions toward what he did in Kampala and everything could have you know led to to his change of position from Kampala to Yumbe. So mm. the people actually have the power yeah. and the relationship between the state and the people is there. The the state recognizes that the what the people are saying and it will depend on like we said what the constitution was saying. Uh, it was about interests. What do you give me? What do I give you? So if I change Hudu from Kampala to Yumbe, are you comfortable? If I bring this so it the relationship is there. It's up to us to recognize what we want, mm. push for it. And, yeah, I think... Yeah, I, I think that um, your statement is trying to evoke, um, let me see, Article 3, Clause 4, uh, Paragraph A and B of the Constitution, which says that all citizens of Uganda shall have the right and duty at all times to, one, defend this Constitution, and in particular to resist any person or group of persons seeking to overthrow the established constitutional order. Or to do all this in their power to restore the cons to restore this constitution after it has been suspended overthrown ab abrogated or amended contrary to this provision so um, are you trying to say that ugandans under circumstances where they feel that maybe individual a is abusing the constitution they have the, the constitution gives them the power to to take action to 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 defend the constitution but it doesn't explicitly describe how they should do that. Should they hold arms and say, where are you abusing my constitution and then hold guns? How should they protect the, the, the constitution or how should they expand the rights that you're trying to say that they actually have? Yeah, uh, yes, uh, like I've said from the start, 
Uganda is not as old as Museveni. Or Museveni mm. is not as old as Uganda. Meaning there were people that came before him. Mm. Uganda is not as old as me. Or there were people that came before us. Mm. There were changes that were made through certain ways, violence and non-violent ways. Mm -hmm. They were there. But what I'm saying is there were changes. Yeah. So these changes can actually... Ch you can't resist change. If yeah. change comes... It is coming. Okay. Yeah. So maybe, maybe the power that we have is what Samantha is trying to say that every five years we have the power, uh, the, the power to renew the contract with yes. with the state and 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 yes, that power could cause a change. Mm. I've always said if you could change a member of parliament, you can't change a president. Probably sure. the president is good, and sure. you are not changing the president. Fair enough. Fair enough. So, okay. Sure. Maybe as we wrap up our discussion here. It's very evident that one of the biggest outcomes of the nineteen of the promulgation of the nineteen ninety five constitution is that it has continuously shrunk uh -huh. the political space, civic or civic rights. Mm. They, we speak of all these liberties, freedom of expression, freedom of association, but as of whether we can actually exercise those rights mm. is a whole other discussion. So the constitution in its wording actually gives Ugandans to do everything in their power to defend the constitution, including taking up arms if they must. But you try it. Try it. <laughs> let, let us, do you remember the Toji Kwata Koka? You know, you know, Samantha, you know better that under the Penal Code Act, incitement is actually an offense. <laughs> So let me so hope you know the Penal Code Act and the Constitution. Let which one? Which one is more powerful? President, of course, the Constitution. President. Yeah, but also let us not incite Uganda to, to, to take up arms. I'm just quoting the wording of the Constitution. I'm not the author. All right, all right. Uh, fair enough. Uh, thank you very much. That brings us to the end of uh, phase one of our conversation. We hope that you are enjoying and learning something from our panelists. If you have a view that you'd love to express, the comment section is right there. Feel free to put your comment on the comment section, but also feel free to go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can get weekly notifications of our conversations. Let's go for a short break and see you in less than a minute. Bye-bye. Well, well, we'll be back from that short commercial break and we don't take it for granted that you've stayed with us and to continue following our conversation. Many thanks and we hope that the comments keep on coming down there in the comment section. Uh, we shall wrap up the issue around uh, the constitution and uh, basically I'm now going to pick the minds of my comrades here regarding what way forward for us as a country. Do you think we have had too many amendments in a short period of time? Because if you to compare our constitution to, the, for example, the United States of America's constitution, it has, I would say, barely had an amendment compared to how much we have had as, as, a, as a country. So basically, your, your last words regarding uh, the way forward of our um, legal regime or of rule of law in Uganda. And I'll just begin with the lawyers once again. Comrade Chris Mpasi. Um, thank you very much, Comrade Kidega. Mine is simply a call for a national conversation. I know this is an attempt that has been made for so long in our history, but never have we seen a conversation that is non national in both content and form. Uh, the, the attempt we had with the Constituent Assembly, which had representatives from all walks of life in Uganda, as we have seen in our previous engagement, had so much influence from certain elements. So we need an honest conversation about certain questions that have you know, kept coming along. And these are things that once a country, once we come into certain situations like the, the recent loss of our dear right honorable speaker, then questions on Buganda's factor in Uganda come up, questions mm. on the land question. Mm. You know, and the like. So we need honest conversations, an honest and national consensus and conversation around this. But even secondly, the truth of the matter is our constitution at its inception in 1995 was a good attempt mm. at us having a tool that's going to make us right the wrongs of the past as a country. But given the over 119 surgeries, which are amendments <laughs> that it has undertaken, I think it is more of an illusion today. We have a country which has um, 
majorities, the parliamentary majorities, one would think gerrymandering and the like. And it becomes very, very risky for the constitution as itself because there are procedures for amendment, meaning the people who have the majorities will, to their whims, amend all these aspects of our constitution. That's where the judiciary, in my view, comes in, uh, judiciary lawyers comes in very handy with the what lawyers call the basic structure doctrine. That what are those aspects of our constitution that even when you've gone through the amendment process that is stipulated in the procedures of the law, you cannot touch them because to touch them would be a constitutional overhaul mm. of the letter of the law. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, many have expressed that the recent amendment of Article 1 or 2B was one of such yeah, uh, concepts in the Constitution, which you know, represented something bigger than you know, the article itself. They represented an entire idea of constitutionalism for us as a country. Issues like separation of powers, yeah? people's ownership of land. So I think the basic structure doctrine remains a very, very, very key tool for the judiciary to use to ensure that they protect the constitution first as a tool for us to look at and ensure that we have um, a, a country full of good governance and democracy. So that is it for me. And I hope that the conversation, the national conversation is sooner than later before because it seems, and sadly to say, as a country, we are in a very, very, very risky time. Well, thank you. Yeah, uh, but just before I leave you, you mentioned something that triggered my mind that I would love you to expand on, which is the Buganda factor in Uganda's politics. If you read the history of our constitution, you will appreciate that, for example, Buganda got its independence on 8th October. Then Uganda as a country got its independence the following day. Mm -hmm. So that only shows you that Buganda has, from time immemorial, had a very fundamental role to play in Uganda's politics. But also, there are certain very fundamental articles of the Buganda Agreement that, to me, I believe have, have carried forth. For example, if you look at the Buganda Agreement, the 20 articles in it, you'll get to appreciate that some of these articles were, were meant to create classes in society. For example, non-natives or the Europeans could not be tried by the native courts. They could not be subjugated to laws made by the Luchiko. So it looks like the aspect of having classes in society began from way back as far as the Buganda Agreement. And what we are seeing today, even when the constitution creates certain classes, whether consciously or subconsciously, it is only a replica of the Buganda, uh, 19 or Buganda Agreement. So just your comment on the Buganda factor in Uganda's constitutional history. Just, just maybe in a minute, do you have a comment? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, mm -hmm. Yesterday, I happened to chance upon a recent paper that the, the Minister of Buganda for Special Duties, mm -hmm. the WHT were Frederick, um, just a second, the, the, the gentleman, the lawyer, it can be immaterial. Yeah, maybe oh maybe yes, yeah. uh, on on the new what you call the new manifesto mm. for federalism. Yeah. It's a fact that Buganda has been an enigma in both our political history, yeah, and uh, our general history as a country. Uh, our country's name was, you know, derived from mm -hmm. an aspect of Buganda, yeah, yeah. Uganda. So, of course, it remains they're changing attitudes, yeah. Mm. We, and that's where the national conversation comes in, at the same attitude expressed by the calls for federalism, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, the same today, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so I think it doesn't help us as a country if we keep uh, uh, sweeping it under the carpet and, you yeah. know, hiding away from the fact that these are conversations. There are people, not just in Uganda, but even all over the country that genuinely believe that we, maybe we can pursue this concept of Uganda in a different political system, mm -hmm. yeah. And I think rather than us as a country viewing each other's opinions with, you know, a lens of cynicism, with a lens of, you know, looking down, no, we think we are the more patriotic ones, you know, the more patriotic ones, we should find ways of striking a balance and coming together to engage because um, Article 178 of the Constitution, which was an attempt at, you know, striking a balance with the calls for federalism, mm. hasn't to this day come into place. I'm aware, according to that, that the document, the presentation to the Luchiko, 
Uganda unanimously, you know, protested against it by not involving in the attempts at decentralizing the regional governments. Mm. Yeah. So I think sooner than later, we need to have a national conversation to have all these questions, at least, you know, making genuine attempts at answering them because if we do not owe it to ourselves, we owe it to our children and our children's children, yeah, posterity. <laughs> Fair enough. Thank you very much, Comrade Pasi. Um, Samantha, your, your last words regarding um, the Constitution. Any amendments you think we need to look at? On the issue of amendments, as Pasi rightly pointed out, as of 2005, I think the Constitution had already undergone, what, 119, maybe around there, which one might look at as a lot of amendments. I, for one, don't think there is anything wrong with amendments. The question is, why are we making the amendments? Because if a, doc if a document, a national document, has certain loopholes that need to be addressed, why not? Yeah, sure. I mean, that's why we're here. And that's why I told you earlier that, for me, I view the Constitution as a tree that all of us should water, prune, yeah. weed, yeah. you know? We should all work towards growing that tree mm. for the good of our successors. So amendments are okay? Amendments are okay. However, I think the challenge that we are grappling with right now is the fact that many of the people that participated in the promulgation of the Constitution got what many may refer to as a road deal. Mm. What they bargained for is not what they got. Mm. So people are still bitter within, those that are still here, and some people have even inherited that bitterness. Mm. You see that there are so many regions that are developing more than others, mm. and someone might distance themselves from connecting that to the national document, but... It stems, as far as, it stems as far as that, and some people may actually argue that it, it, there is a deliberate effort to keep certain regions mm. underdeveloped to show the rest of the country what can happen mm. if you try to oppose mm. the powers that be. But uh, regions like Karamoja that overwhelmingly vote for the NRM continue to struggle with issues around development. You know those are not the regions issues, I'm referring issues to. Issues around infrastructure. You know the regions I'm referring to. No, I don't. Well, I mean, look at Northern Uganda. Yes, Karamoja that place is part has of potential. Uganda. That place has potential to grow. Why hasn't it grown? And Karamoja is part of Northern Uganda. Well, maybe that's why they're also... Maybe they're, 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 they're suffering mm. as a result of their neighbor, them being neighboring yeah. to the part and I'm talking maybe about. maybe speaking of raw deal, do you think... Because Uganda actually had to... Um, because Tanzania or Tanganyika got its independence in 1961. Mm -hmm. Ghana around 1960. So there was a lot of independence being achieved by many African states around the 1960s, the early 1960s. And Uganda was actually timetabled, if I'm to use that word, to get its independence in 1961. But because of the Buganda factor that was clamoring or agitating for its federalism, that they should be independent and not be conjoined with the entire Uganda protectorate, delayed the process of us getting independence. So maybe that was a road deal for them. The road deal I actually had... refer to mm. is our, leave alone the colonialists. I'm talking about the road dealers of the 1995 constitution. Okay. Those that voted for are reaping. Yeah. Those that voted against mm. are still being punished till mm. date. So, and again, I agree with him when he talks about the need for a national conversation. Mm. And I think Justice Odochi has tried to hold what he referred to as the national dialogue. I actually mm. attended a few sessions mm. and I could see what he was trying to achieve with that. He's trying to deal with the bitterness that so many Ugandans still mm. carry within them today. Because a question like federal for Uganda, is that a discussion we should still be having today? Not or should we be building towards a wholesome Uganda? Yeah. So people still hold on to certain sentiments. People are yeah. still bitter because what they bargained for in the 1995 constitution is mm. not what they got. Mm. I mean, uh, President Museveni kicked off with restoring kingdoms. He restored Buganda, but he didn't give them what they actually wanted. They thought with the kingdom came the federal. And they've mm. been agitating for that since day one. Mm. That is why today you see someone who's running for presidency coming out to defend his king vehemently when he's attacked. Because at the end of the day, even as someone who's running for national office, he's still a Muganda, so he still has that bitterness. Mm. We need to erase those lines as Ugandans. Why? The okay. tribal lines. Why? Just, just... Because our agenda is common. We want a great Uganda. <laughs> but does a great Uganda come at the expense of our Ugandanness? That is but why Uganda is an artificial creation, like we agreed. Mm. <laughs> but I the fact that I might be from Acholi or she might be from Buganda. I'm from Acholi. Yeah, yeah. You see, <laughs> my brother is from Acholi. You are Acholi before you before before Uganda was created. They actually yeah. were there. Yeah. I think in 
the national conversation we should you know put into consideration all these facts yeah and not look at just identity less creatures that were placed in one border mm. but rather we say how can we then unite all our interests mm. for the betterment of the entire yeah, country without erasing mm. without erasing yeah. the fact that maybe our it could cultures, be, yeah, our and, cultures norms, and our norms our but even most importantly mm. our desire for self rule yeah for self determination actually yeah. talking about the exact same thing up yeah. to a certain point oh, yeah. Yeah. i agree that we are who because before i'm a ugandan and i'm a, I'm, I'm a muganda yeah, before you're Ugandan and you are naturally and so mm. when we were signing this document what was your bargain what was our bargain so we need to get back to the drawing board as Ugandans now look at the notes we were using then compare with the notes now see what mm. is plausible what can we achieve yeah. what can we not achieve what do we need to do as a country to yeah. propel ourselves yeah, forward but also one fact that we must address our minds too is the fact that Uganda is a multinational state yeah there are many nations within the same country. Yes. I think worldwide it's only China and maybe North Co- uh, uh, and Korea that are nation states whereby you find about 90% of the country's population are homogeneously of the same culture, mm. speak the same tribe, you know, have common set of values. Now Uganda is multinational, there are many nations within the same country. So that by all means is going to influence both our national interests but yeah. also our foreign policy. Yeah. So I think uh, moving forward as we make some of these proposals we should also address our minds to the fact that we are a multinational state. But we state. need to be realistic but, mm. because for example when he talks about the federal mm. is it something that is practical today? Can you actually achieve self rule because look at Buganda is a kingdom best here in our capital the heart of our economy. Mm. What is self rule going to do to the rest of Uganda honestly? Maybe Uganda the, itself today mm. has so many people from all over the country living in it. People that own land here. Mm. Intermar- I'm personally a result of an intermarriage. I'm half Uganda, half Itesod. Mm. So where does that leave me when people are drawing hash lines, yeah, you know? True. So the discussion is no longer tribal. Yeah. The discussion is now Uganda. We should move towards a single So the national um, dialogue should be about us thinking about Uganda mm. not as cake. Okay, you know? just just uh, let me get your comment before I move to to Ndugokori. Yeah. The argument of how our, con- our our constitutions are amended. Let me take you back to 2005 when Ugandans clamored and agitated for multi-party dispensation. Mm-hmm. And the NRA um, notion or uh, propagandist put out the notion of Tube Jeko. Mm-hmm. So do you think at times in this constitutional amendments there is misrepresentation that the NRA at the time said that for for us we are a movement and for those who don't want movement to be jeko so majority of ugandans perceived it as oh let us uh, th- those those who want to leave the movement let them go those who want to step off the bus yes those who want to get off the bus <laughs> let them go to be jeko so at times maybe the aspect of representation moves ugandans for example in in cases where we have to hold a referendum at times misrepresentation could affect their decision do you, do you think that happens definitely um, and again that goes back to what i mentioned earlier that uh, th- there's sort of been a curtail on how much civic education ugandans receive as a whole because so many people voted in that referendum but if you ask them today what it was actually about they don't know. they don't really have the information yeah. even these amendments that we are doing today parliamentarians who actually have the power to vote will go ahead and vote right. and they do not know what exactly they are signing yeah. into for Ugandans so i think we need to educate the masses as much as we can especially those of you in these spaces of yeah. like civil society you have a huge role to play in educating Ugandans on their civic duties and all of that yeah. because at the end of the day as i said amendment is not the problem but why yeah. are we amending even a civic duty as bare minimum as your right to vote many Ugandans don't know that uh comrade okori your last words regarding um constitutional amendments do you think some articles need to be changed i think many of articles need to be changed but again do the ugandans know their constitution it mm. should be the biggest question how many apart from these legal scholars and a few of us who love to read mm. many of the ugandans don't know the laws not even any they don't care about that and i think the the leader of this country is happy <laughs> leading such a state of people who don't have information because he can easily run over them the way he wants. I think the amendments I'll go clear to them. One is the term limit should be reinstated. Anybody who does that will have that good to this country. Mm. Uh let uh, uh, talk, we talk about the independence of the of the different arms of the state. 
they should really be independent, as you had proposed earlier that uh, in Kenya, the Chief Justice and the, the Electoral Commission Chairpersons and what are entirely voted for and they act on independent values and views. So if that comes to Uganda, we'll know that now the Museveniism has gone. And now we shall be speaking as Ugandans and not uh, owning his document anymore. Thank you. Well, fair enough. Um, Helen, mm. he says term limits need to be reinstated. Age limits as well? Age limits, I'm okay with it because oh, okay. the Katumbas yeah, okay, came out. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, <laughs> okay. age <laughs> limits is not an issue, but uh, you belong to the national resistant movement. Yeah. And uh, some of these amendments are being uh, championed yeah. by your political party. <laughs> Things like what he mentioned, term limits. So what do you think? Do, do you think term limits need to be reinstated? But also, what is your general yeah. opinion? No, I think it still comes down to interest. Mm. You, you had him say that he's okay with age limits. So mm. what makes him think I'm not okay, I'm okay, I'm not okay with, with term, term limits? limits. Yeah. yeah, so it still comes down to his interests mm. are in the age limits because mm. he knows he's still young. Mm. So the president's interests are in the term, term limits, limits because he still wants the time. <laughs> mm. So uh, uh, meaning if he ever gets the power, he will, you know, amend the constitution but also what uh, my, my view on the on the amendments so yeah there's so many amendments that should be done mm. as, as a country for example when you mentioned that america has not gone through so many amendments america mm. is very very old yeah yeah like it's, it's you can't compare the the 50 something years that we have and then the 100 something years america, over 200 over, over, actually. Actually, over 200 mm. As a, for example, when a child is growing, you don't limit them. You, yeah. get, you let them fall, you let them uh, come up, you let, let them run, you, you, you let them. Because mm. you know that a time is going to come when they've learned. Mm. So as Uganda is okay to go through those constitutional amendments as long as it's... For the right reasons. Yeah, for the right reasons for us to, you know, to... Because we have a lot to do as a country before we start comparing ourselves to America and Britain. Yeah. Yeah, but... Uh, and... For example, like he mentioned that you can't, uh, you, you, Uganda has to grow with our Ugandanness. Uh, I've been seeing what has been happening with the speaker, uh, mm. the, 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 the death of the speaker. Mm. It, 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 our Ugandanness doesn't really show that we are supposed to start electing a new speaker mm. before we bury the person. He's not even here in the country. And do, you, do, you, do you want to relate that to the Banyankwede? Culture, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we don't do that. You respect that this person has been a, a big figure in our mm. country. He has cr put a brick on this country. You can't just disrespect them by mm. trying to replace them. It's like, you know what, you're gone. Yes, we know he's gone, but the brick. Mm. But also, there's no way the constitution was going to be disrespected as yeah. well. It had to continue. But that's one of the amendments. Today morning, I saw what came out. Uh, the barrier is going to cost 2 point something, 2.5 2 billion. billion. Yeah. And the constitution is clear, 60% of uh, his salary is supposed to be used for mm. his barrier. Those are some of amendments. That's, mm. um, uh, we are arguing that the 60% is okay because, you know, the, the speaker was entitled to it. But let's, let, let it not be for barrier. Let mm. 60%, we say 40%, goes to the family that he's leaving behind. 20% mm -hmm. for barrier. For God's sake, the person is gone. Mm. These people that are enjoying, you know, they tell you that you're not, when you die, you're not even going to enjoy anything of that barrier. Mm. So that, that 60 that 2.5 billion, mm. Olanya is not going to, to, to enjoy any of mm. that. Mm. So let, it be enjoy, let him rest in peace knowing that my 60%, 40% is going to my family, to my children, but not to my barrio. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure he doesn't care about what will happen in his yeah. barrio, but he cares about what will happen to his children once he is gone. Yeah. yeah so some uh, such amendments that show our Ugandanness should really, you know, be considered. Yeah. But Pastor, just one second. Um, uh, showing our Ugandanness, is this where we wish that customary law maybe was repugnant to? Uh, re, uh, sorry, is this where we wish that the constitution could be repugnant to customary law, whereby under such circumstances, the customary law takes precedent, which is of course very uh, impossible because the, the constitution is the supreme court, supreme law of the land, but do we wish that under such cases, customary law takes precedent and we say no, our, our culture doesn't accept this and the constitution can first you know, put to hold, let's go by our customary way of doing things. Yeah, yeah, of, of course, um, it's regrettable. Yeah. Yeah. But given the fact that, as she mentioned, we are a project in progress, this mm. is the first time Article 824 has been tested mm. where sitting speakers yeah, yeah, actually. Yeah. So it's the first time maybe the conversation has been opened. Yeah. But also, I think it 
it opens the conversation of the importance of customary law in our mm. laws. Yeah. Mm. Uh, should we maybe, if we are considering amendment or changing yeah, certain aspects, yeah, us. consider mm. such aspects, for instance, our views about barrio as Africans, yeah, mm. or should the country go on and then forget about the fact that we as Africans consider, uh, attach a certain level of, you know, sacred view mm. to the barrio, most of an important personality in the country. Yeah, and then, sure, and then, sure, and fair and enough. And I'm glad that uh, the people of Acholi, where I come from, have insisted that they shall welcome, welcome him with our famous bola dance. And I, I, I look forward to uh, uh, taking part in that dance. Uh, uh, comrades, our time is fast spent, and that surely brings us to the end of uh, the constitution. Let's move shift quickly to shift gears towards the prices of commodities. And on this, I hope you can spend at most really um, two minutes each just to get your, your view, because I know you're not an economist, so mm. I will not really stress you so much regarding the, the prices of commodities. Um, finance secretary, <laughs> at least you, at least there is an aspect of finances to your title. And the, the students who have to buy commodities each and every single day, the students who have to buy books, who have to buy soap, who have to buy salt, are grappling with these prices. One, what has UNSA done about this? But also, have you taken interest to find out why prices are, are, are skyrocketing? I think uh, in, such an, in such an economy as this, uh, prices are determined by the, the forces of demand and supply. But again, there's what they call consumer protection. Okay. And uh, such a government would have really invested a lot of time in understanding on how it can protect the consumers. Mm. In a market structure that, that, that I see the commodities talk about, like soap, sugar, these are not monopolistic goods or something like that. They're in a perfect competition where, where there are a lot of suppliers making the same products. But I can imagine the prices are skyrocketing at the same price. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are essential goods again. They're not just any goods that are, maybe you're buying cigarettes, so even if it is high, government has no, no, no chance to say, yeah, that's a harmful product, so we don't care about it. As well, sir, we've tried to, 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 to air out on different media platforms and, uh, and writing as well to the one where they petitioned the parliament over, over, over increasing prices and they're saying, what is the problem? And there have been no answers. Last time I had the Minister of Finance say he has nothing he can do to the increasing prices. What should he do is the question. Mm. Of course, the private, the private sector foundation is there and I think government can, uh, can invest its time in engaging these people. But again, I keep having this answer in my mind that people in government own these companies and so they have no questions. Mm. They don't want prices to come down. Imagine the cost of production must, might have increased. Mm. But of course, there is what we call sharing of the costs. Isn't that an allegation, Comrade? It's an allegation, maybe, mm. but for, for record it is from me. Mm. <laughs> because <laughs> if, you say, also, if you say government I, I said uh, given individuals have owned, owned, owned these companies, I minus... Minus giving us proof, then it's an allegation. So I've owned it, so oh, okay. for record it is from me. Okay. So I'm saying that uh, if, let's say, the cost of production has increased by 5,000, why put the entire burden to the consumer? Mm. I just share 2,5 to 5. Okay. And that is where the, 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 the producers have failed to, to, engage, to engage from. And again, there's what in economics we call that the consumer is the king. It's mm. not there in Uganda. Because if you're the king, that means you can, you can determine the prices. But in okay. Uganda, you as a consumer, you cannot determine the prices. So may I think this entire cry of, of prices going up and down, it is government. And if government knows very well that uh, the time, uh, the long time of the long time of lockdown, country, I mean, companies uh, had a lot of, uh, they were highly indebted. They would have given them tax holidays, maybe. So maybe they also have they also have the liberal reasons of saying that yes, the costs of production have gone high. You still want the high taxes. So what should we do? Mm. So, the dialogue should be between your, I mean, a bit between government and the private sector. Mm. We as a citizens, we have less we can do. And how can government intervene? Maybe subsidizing some of these utilities? Yes, subsidize tax holidays, tax holidays, such things, and I've not done it. To lower cost of production. Lower cost of production. Fair I'm enough. Very quiet about that. Um, Helen, let me come to you. When the world was caught up in between communism or capitalism, the pro-capitalist fostered the argument that um, economic liberalism is actually a fundamental aspect of democracy. That for us to espouse democracy, there must be economic liberty. 
and my understanding of economic liberty is that let people let the market be open let the forces of demand and supply take play and as government as or as a state let's have limited intervention could this be some of the repercussions of a liberal economy whereby government does not come in to set price ceilings that for example a bar of soap cannot go beyond 5000 and that's a price ceiling set by government mm -hmm. but because we have decided to liberalize the economy because i mean you want democracy after all then this is uh, these are some of the implications so do you think what is happening today is as a result of a liberal economy where government isn't intervening or there could be more than meets the eye I think there's more than meets the eye. Mm. I am an entrepreneur myself. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, and I, I am actually a producer because I produce my own products. So have you also increased prices of your products? <laughs> Not really, because that's, so that's why I'm saying it. there's more than meets the eye. Mm. Because as if I'm, if I'm a, a cosmetics um, producer, right? Mm. I'm not going to... Uh, I, I will have to increase my prices depending on... Uh, the increase in my cost of production, mm. the, the, the increase in my raw materials, a certain raw material. For example, the people producing soap tell you that actually it's not, when you look at what is causing, it's like one raw material, mm. one raw material that is bringing all this. And the problem is it's the major raw material in producing soap. Mm. So uh, when you asked about the liberal government and intervening, it, even if the government wanted to intervene, which it should actually intervene, mm. but... It, it still looks at the liberty it gave to the private sector, the manufacturers, and what. So it, it still comes down to, you're saying that it gave liberty to these people, meaning mm. these people are the ones that are not doing that, mm. the, their role as mm. the manufacturers, as the private sector. They're not doing their role mm. to, let's say, come up and be like, if the government is doing this, but there is a way we can actually set prices. There is mm. a way we can sit down and agree that a bar of soap mm. shouldn't go beyond this. First, like Okori said, let's do 50-50. You get this part, uh, consumer gets this part, cost of production this. Because as an entrepreneur anyway, you're supposed to know that you're supposed to, of course, make a profit for your enterprise to continue moving. Mm. Yeah, so the liberty given by the government shouldn't be abused by the private sector yeah. and the manufacturers. No, it shouldn't. It should be the, the private, the, the people government gave liberty to should use it mm. for their benefit. You know, for them to benefit and also the consumer plus the government. So the government has a role to play, but so do the private citizens. Yes, yes, yes. The private citizens, the people that are in charge of the economy, the ones that are actually running it. But these are capitalists. All they care about is making of money. Of course, of course. They, they, they don't yeah. care whether you buy a bar of soap at okay. 20000 Yeah, but at the end of the day, the whether you're a capitalist or not, mm. you have to know the repercussions of the, of the prices that you're setting. Mm. As a capitalist, if uh, we have two capitalists here, the capitalist that will move faster with his business is the one that will be able to determine what my cost of production is, what the consumer will be able to buy, how, what can the consumer be able to afford. Yeah. So it will be depending on how smart the capitalist is. Uh, mm. Like if you just want to be a capitalist, well and good. If you want to be a great capitalist, you have to determine how this, this product is going to be on the market mm. and how much should it be so that in 10 years, 20 years from now, my product is able to be, you know, bought. Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. Uh, President Passi, the World Trade Organization last week or the other week released a report and said that we anticipate the prices of, of, um, of bread and things that are made as a byproduct of wheat to increase. Why? Because the Russia-Ukraine crisis, because you know Russia is the biggest export of wheat, okay, across the world. So, do you think that the Russia-Ukraine crisis is somehow going to um, instigate even the prices of other commodities which are still not yet being highly charged, like bread and other things that are produced from wheat? So speak to the aspect of the international relations, okay, and um, the, the, the factors at the international scene and how they eventually affect even the lowest uh, person in Uganda. So maybe you could tie the international aspect to the prices that we see at 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 at, at country level. Yeah. Well, thank you, comrade. Uh, the the YWTO report mm. was actually reiterated last week by mm. the Minister of Finance in yes. their press release. Mm. They attributed the current inflation, which is at three point two percent, to among other things the Russian Ukrainian invasion, 
then also the hoarding of certain commodities by certain capitalists. Yeah. Then they attributed it to also the issues between the Uganda Kenya border. Yeah. And I, I think I think to an extent one would view it that this is an escapist approach by our government because we expect answers as people. But now mm. if the minister is saying you expect us to do what? <laughs> because it leaves us in despair. <laughs> yeah. Papa leaves to wash. <laughs> <laughs> it leaves us in despair. But also, like the question begs the answer. You know, the guilt, huge is the, is the guilt of an unnecessary, an unnecessary war. Okay. And at least now as Ugandans, even the Wanainchi, we are noticing the effect that someone's decision up there yeah, mm. can have on us. Yeah, now mm. people are having to part ways with about 10,000 for just a bar of soap. Mm. Of course, I think the government can do more like colleagues have mentioned. Mm. But also, we, we as Ugandans should identify the opportunities that this creates. In the report by the Ministry of Finance, they mentioned that one approach that government hopes to undertake is to actually subsi subsidize the, the, the farmers in northern Uganda mm. to you know, produce some of these products, for instance, that help in the making of soap. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah to see that as a country, we can also become more self-sustaining mm. because now with the consumer price index going this high and there isn't any promise that it's going to, to get any lower than mm. this yeah i think the mm. government can do more subsidizing and making sure that as the youth they mm. create for us an environment yeah that, that can incentivize our ability to feed our nation with some of these essential commodities mm. such that uh, putin or tomorrow it could be person x or y's decision internationally doesn't affect us as much mm. yeah um, in Uganda. So I think, as and of course, as, as a country that relies so much on imports, mm. this is a, a, a reawakening for us to do mm. more on incentivizing our people's ability to produce some of these uh, items which we can carry out a niche and then, you know, you never know what can come out of that. We could be the next producers and we also feed the world. Oh, fair yeah. enough. Uh, Samantha, my last question to you is that, um, and I'll pick it up from what Comrade Helen and Comrade Pasi are trying to say, that let us um, maybe do what we call import substitution, mm -hmm. okay? And I'll take you back to around 1918, when Alexander Hamilton, as Secretary of State of the USA, introduced the smooth holy tariff. And the idea was that, how can we encourage the development of domestic companies? And how they did that was to levy high taxes on imports, whereas subsidize uh, the domestic producers. And that is why today we celebrate the Wall Street companies because their government took a deliberate effort to encourage the economy to be inward looking rather than outward looking. Mm -hmm. The case for Uganda is that our domestic producers actually choke on taxes. Whereas the foreign investors have all these tax holidays, have all these tax incentives. So it looks like our economy is not exactly inward looking. And that is why there is an imbalance of trade. We are importing more than we are exporting because our domestic companies are just not functioning. They are being frustrated, they are being um, gagged on taxes. I don't know how many young businesses live to see their first birthday. I, I look forward to celebrating Variat, making 10 years, five years, or, or even one year. <laughs> yeah, with the, with the high birthday. taxes. No, no, <laughs> fifth month. Yeah, oh, fifth okay. month. Yeah. But <laughs> we, we pray that domestic um, innovators like uh, uh, Helen can actually benefit from the government opportunities mm -hmm. and subsidies so that our economy, our, our economy is inward looking rather than outward looking. So do you think we should continue to be an outward looking economy or we should now begin to say, no, 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 enough is enough. Let's be inward looking. You know, um, again, I'd like to put a disclaimer out there. Mm -hmm. I am in no way an expert on economic matters, but these are matters that affect the one ing like myself so i'll definitely have something to say mm. but it just reminded me of this one scenario in high school you know we used to have breakfast and every every cup of tea came with a bun mm. those round pieces of bread so before we knew it they had reduced it to one bun now the, the other break at 11 didn't have a bun so mm. we asked the head teacher what was happening, happening. and she told us credit crunch Mm. Mm. So imagine people between the ages of 12 and 17 having mm. to digest that concept of credit crunch. But now that I look about it, what did, now, that, now that I look back, 
what did credit crunch have to do with uh, circumstances like yeah. that? Because was our school planning on taking a loan to feed us, yet we had paid tuition? What I'm trying to say is the government has a lot to do, but we as Ugandans mm. also have a role to play. Yeah. You know, yeah. now there was a, that was a head teacher avoiding the actual reason. Maybe yeah. they were trying to save up on profits. Maybe yeah. they were trying to maximize profit, which is really the goal of a business person maximize profits at all costs. Yeah. But they were costing us and they were not giving us proper justification. If mm. anything, they were misleading. Yeah. I had another scenario with a landlord that went ahead to increase our rent mm. because of the rental, the bill. The bill. The, yeah. <laughs> before it was even passed. <laughs> mm. the pas this person just increased our rent. They had not done renovations, nothing. There's no justification. There was no even prior three months notice. Yes. Yeah. So me being the lawyer that I am, of course, they say we have Kajanja. I engaged this person and I asked, what is the cause for the increase in rent? And they were bold enough to tell me it was because of the bill, <laughs> that they were now going to pay tax. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, Ugandans, wow, we are out to make money. We are all out to earn our bread. But let's not lose our humaneness in all of this. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, you're still a human. It's human being. So when a prime minister comes out to tell us that we should use purple leaves mm -hmm. to wash clothes in a country where we have barely survived Ebola, where we are still encouraging people to wash their hands with soap. Mm. Are we failing to draw the distinction between wants and needs? So maybe just to sum it up, we should all be reminded of the words of the late Desmond Tutu, that in whatever you do, just do good. Do Eventually, good. this good will overwhelm the world. Create a win-win situation. Yeah. Okay. Make your pro and your profit, but mm -hmm. at the end of the day, do not do it at the expense of another person's survival. Yeah. Mm. Fair enough, colleagues, we have at most three minutes to close this. So I know we all love or loved the late right rainbow speak of parliament. So I'll give you all a minute to just really tell us what you think about his legacy. What shall you remember most about him? I, I know he was a very active student leader. So I'll begin with Okori, Helen, uh, Percy, then because it's a month of women, the, the, the lady will, oh. we will speak last. So Okori, the, okay, okay, Okori, <laughs> Percy, then the two ladies will, will speak last. So you have one minute, the legacy of, uh, of the Right Honorable, the late. I think, I think the late Right Honorable Speaker, Jacob Lokori Olanya, was a very great gentleman, he was passionate about leadership. Uh, I think when he was guild speaker or something uh, in Makere by then, they really advocated and championed for, for Uganda National Student Association. And, and we as ones are first of all, standing with the family and we say, it's, a, it's, it's really absurd that the nation through such a person. Then personal, my personal view, as a person from Northern Uganda, mm. uh, as a person from Lango, we are heartbroken. And mm. uh, it's not easy, but there's nothing to do. It is, it is him who takes, and it is him who gives. Who gives. So, as you wait to dance the Lakara, I want to remind that local, <laughs> Jacob Olanya was a Langi, so we'll also welcome him yeah. in our own traditional dance, to sure. make sure we really give him a good Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Comrade Pasi. I know he was MLS president. Oh, yes, oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, on, on my behalf and on behalf of the Makere Law Society, um, I would love to extend also our heartfelt condolences with the family then and the nation for the loss of such an instrumental personality yeah, in, our, in the present of our country, like we've identified. As a country, we are at a place where we need as many instrumental brains like the late a right honorable speaker in trying to channel and you know writing the wrongs of the past and he was a patriotic gentleman in 1992 he served as the makerelo society president and his legacy still lives on to today wow. yeah and I, I think as young people and as young lawyers we can look to him if at all we need an example of someone to aspire to, you know, to look beyond the law. Yes, you're studying law, but then beyond considering that, how are you going to involve in changing the lives of your people, mm. changing, uh, getting involved in the politics of the nation, and, you know, by extent, influencing um, the, the, the good side of this country. So uh, we stand together with the rest of the country and may his soul rest in peace. Fair enough. Helen. The late was an advocate for the rights of women. I, I on several occasions heard him saying, you know, we must bring up the women. So yeah. what's your own legacy? What's your own perception of his legacy? You no, know, that is so true. He was an advocate of women's rights. Uh, I don't even know what, what the late Olanya didn't advocate for. Yeah. Cause, uh, but one of the key 
things I remember about him, he was, I think, on one of the interview, either on the spot or barometer. And I remember he said he, he was giving speech, free speech to the, to the members of parliament. He said uh, uh, there is limited time in parliament for members of parliament to actually speak. So he was suggesting that we have general... General, mm. uh, like de, de, general sittings, whereby whether they're not payable, payable, but every member who feels like now this is the time to say whatever I want, let mm. us say it, and then we can pick it and then take it through the More actual... Chimeza. Yeah, yeah, like, so that could show you the kind of person he was. We saw one of the clips of his apologizing, you yeah. know, like, this is this is not something that you normally see among of, of leaders, leaders of that high, yeah, yeah. high, like, showing that... He was humble, so really, may his soul rest in peace, and may we emulate all the nice things that he actually showed to the country. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Samantha, he was a lawyer just like yourself. Mm -hmm. What shall you remember about him? Yes, I actually had just one opportunity to interact with him when I was much younger. Uh, we had a debate tournament organized by the Debate Society mm. Uganda, and he was one of the few parliamentarians who had the courtesy to spare part of his precious time to come and, you know, hold debate with young people. And for us, that meant a lot because it showed that he valued what we had to say as young people. And today, it's very hard to find people of a much older generation engaging in uh, discourse with people yeah. our age. They view us as rebellious. They view us as inexperienced. But he was actually very interested in hearing what we had to say. And for me, that was very humbling. Mm. You know what they say. A good leader is one who knows the way, shows the way. Yeah, I feel like he way. has really done that. He, he did that. And the legacy he has left behind is one that is rich. We will forever remember him. May his soul rest in eternal peace. Yeah. Thank you very much, Comrade Okori, Comrade Samantha, Comrade Percy, and Comrade Helen, for being such an amazing panel. My my honest opinion is you've been great. I, oh, I must you. say that Thank before you. camera. You, uh, Comrade Rashid and the technical team, it's always humbling to know that you spare the time to ensure that our viewers get this show perfectly on time. Of course, on my own behalf and on behalf of the Youth Roundtable, we continue to send our sincere condolences to the people of this country of the untimely demise of a gallant son of the soil. And we hope that he joins the likes of Samora Michelle, the likes of Malimu Julius Nyerere, the likes of Nelson Mandela. Let them dine uh, upon how much they've achieved on this planet Earth. From me to you, until next week, thank you for joining us. Catch you next week, same time, same day. Bye-bye.